Hello, hello. Thanks for joining us for the Hummingbird watercolor. I have pretty pretty good setup here. I also sort of like, you know, this is our second real one. And so things are gonna um, develop, I guess is a good word. And I wanna just talk about some preliminary setup type things. I also went and dug out my old watercolors so you could see what my setup used to be. And when I say old, let's see, I'm talking 30, 35 years ago, like in my 20s. So um, I today am going to use, I think I'm going to use the core set that I got, which looks like this. It is, um, Talbot, we can go ahead and go overhead because I'm going to be showing right. lots of things around me. Um, this was a set of 24 colors and each... Sorry, it's, someone's saying there's double sound. Oh. So I don't see an issue, but... Hmm. Huh. I turned... I had turned that off. Does more than one person hear double sound? <laughs> yeah, I guess that's a good question. I'm not... Um, yeah, not sure what would cause that. Someone else says they don't hear it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, all right, well, we're, we're gonna go on. If it continues to be a problem for, especially for more than one person, then. Yes, let, let us know. Um, I have, okay, so I have this set. So it's 24 tubes, and the tubes are how many? They're usually by milliliters. Five milliliters. So they're, they're small-ish tubes, but this will last a long time. And then to use them, you have a couple of options. You can, I purchased a 24, this is called a half pan. So you, it basically you're making your own little set of pans. I did not fill these up. I put enough, you know, for several paintings into each little pan. And then this came with, well, you know, when you open it up, you have some spaces to mix. So that's, that's what I got, um, let's see, New York Central Art Supply. This is what I got for this set, to set up this set. Are they, how, what are they? They're, they're, liquid. they're liquid, you squeeze them out, okay. and then they will kind of dry out oh, in there, okay. but then you just, just like these, yeah. you spray them with some water, and you're good to go. So here's, it's fun, like th this is this is old school. This is how it used to be made. This is like some army issue watercolor. <laughs> watercolor. Um, so this would hold your tubes and your brushes, and then this opens up and um, reveals an ancient disaster. But that this was your spot to put all your colors and do your mixing. I guess this was like a little, so you could hold it. So if you were doing some plein air stuff, now, if you're in the studio, um, you might have something like this. So this is so old, it's embarrassing. Like it is, um, but they still make them. So this is a bigger tray and it has this dust cover basically that you could take off. And then this is what I used to do all my paintings <laughs> with. And then you can arrange your palette. How you like, let's see, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight eight, 16, 20, this is also 24. So you would take your tubes and squeeze your colors in here. So that's some uh, old stuff. And then this was my box of watercolors. And I, like I said, I mainly had Windsor and Newtons and these are pretty much dried up. Windsor Newtons. Windsor Newton. You don't want your watercolor to sound like crap, <laughs> like that. <Crab> <laughs> yeah, 
this is this box is uh, now trash. But it's a cute box. It is a cute box. That's yeah. I like the things. Could you could you cut those open and then like pulverize it to the powder? I don't know if it's worth it. I mean, maybe you could, but you gotta think about these things. Is this is this worth my time? All right, let me show the palettes. This is the set like this. And when we did the Fox, we had a little bit of issue because, let me zoom in just a little bit. Um, because my paints were not arranged the same way that your paints were. And there was probably a variety. I'm sure they just kind of shoved these things in there. So I put them in this order, which I have shared previously. And I went um, kind of like yellows to reds. I've got my browns and then I switch to green, go to blue and then the one purple. Pretty much every color in here, I have a coordinating color in the core set, which I made a little um, sample sheet I'll show you. So this was shared previously. I don't know if you guys have taken the time to arrange them this way, but it is nice just to be able to say, you know, number three or number six. Um, but I think you'll see as I go which color I'm using and be able to um, coordinate with your own set. But if you wanted to make sure you were set up the same way, you could scroll back on the, I think it's on the fine art page. Anything that I want to be accessible to everyone over time, I will put on uh, Sarah Jo Renzulli colon fine art because that, um, unlike the group where things get moved, you know, and there's a lot of posts, that's not gonna have very many posts and you'll be able to go see what information you need. Okay, so this is the core colors. Again, there's 24. The pan set, the less expensive pan set that we bought has more greens. Um, and I'd say this one has more yellows. And so there's a few things that don't match up. One thing that it has that I just discovered recently in oils is called natural tint. And that's a fun thing to have. It's like a, it's like a great thing to glaze onto shadows. Um, but today, just to give you an idea of what we're gonna be using, for the background, I'm gonna do a wet and wet technique I'm going to do what I would call a vignette, which means I'm not painting all of the way to the edges. To me, that became overwhelmingly green um, to paint all of the way to the edges. This is the one I was most happy with. So I'm gonna wet the background and then I'm gonna drop in, it would be your um, cad yellow and cobalt teal. So it would be three and, wait a minute, cobalt teal. Cad yellow and emerald. It would be three and 16 for the background. And I picked those because they're nice and bright and pure. And then we can muddy it up or like counteract it with a little bit of orange and purple and just kind of dim it down a little bit. Now, originally I was not going to put these detailed um, grasses and sprouts or whatever, you know, fronds in here, but you guys were doing that in the paint puddle. And I was like, wow, I really like that. And it kind of needs it because it needs that third element. We have a bird and a flower and then, you know, twos aren't great. So this third detail element is, is perfect. That's the background. And then for the flower, I am mainly using eight and nine, which is um, pink and alizarin. And then in the core colors, if you happen to have them, I'm gonna use magenta and maybe a little bit of alizarin. And then to deepen it, we're gonna use um, 
purple and thalo green. On the other set, we also have purple and it would be your viridian, viridian green. Oh wait, where did that go? This one. Um, and then in the bird, I'm gonna use that same, I like to use the same colors as much as possible in each subject so that they all relate to each other. That eliminates the bad Photoshop look of, oh, my background is all these colors, but then the bird is like these six separate colors. Um, so the bird is gonna have that same vibrant um, cobalt teal or emerald in it, and then some of the orange, and that's gonna, that's making these and some of the yellow, some of the um, cadmium yellow, and that's making these really bright greens. And then we're gonna use um, ultramarine and a little bit of purple and a little bit of viridian where we need to really deepen the blue around the face. Um, so that's just a sort of a little bit of a roadmap in terms of which paints you're gonna be accessing from your palette. I did, I'm gonna back up a little bit and we're talk about the group for a second. I'm so, I'm just so proud of the courage and the spirit that everybody is showing in the group. It's, you know, it can be scary to create in the first place and scary to share. So there's a lot of bravery going on with um, everybody just jumping in. You know, I recommended, oh, try it. Here's the reference image, try this beforehand. And so many of you did. So that was awesome. And, um, they were varied and of course, cause we're all creating uh, from our own place, but um, I could pick up and learn from every single one of them. And like even just the idea of, you know, you guys adding more detail um, technique. There was a lot of real kind of stained glass looking effects. Um, the alcohol ink, did you see the alcohol mm -hmm. ink one? Yeah. That's incredible. I got it. I've never played with that. so. I'm definitely gonna have to try that. Okay, I think that is about it on the color. I'll leave these up here in case I need to refer to them. And in terms of my setup, I did, I have this um, spray bottle, great for spritzing your paint to, you know, to make them easily accessible in terms of like swishing your brush around and getting a good amount of paint on your brush. And then I have two, um, let's zoom out. Doo, doo, doo. Okay. I have two glass jars and what I've been doing is wiping my brush off on my paper towel, which I have here. And then swishing it in what I'm calling my dirty water and then wiping my paper towel again. Now, every time I put my brush into this other jar, it's my clean water and it's not gonna get as polluted by other colors. So dirty water and clean water. And I have a ruler and um, an eraser and a pencil. Yeah, I think that's it. Put this out of the way. Any questions or anything? There's not really questions, people just chatting a little okay. bit. Okay. <laughs> um, I printed out the reference image. It glows more on a screen, so it gives you a little bit more detail. So if you have it on a screen and are able to refer to it, that's awesome. I do have mine available here on screen as well if I need to, if I feel like I need to look at it. Question about brush sizes. Yes, okay. At the minimum, you want a broad brush for washes. This one's interesting. It's like, it gets thin towards the tip. This, like something even in the um, one to one and a half inch size is great because there's times that you need to attack, you know, be able to cover ground. Um, generally in painting, for a loose, you know, um, let's see, like to keep it less overworked, the, you want to use the largest brush possible 
all the time. As soon as you start to go to a smaller brush, especially with watercolors, because there's times that you, you need to work while the paint is wet or you know while the um, paper is wet, as soon as you go to a smaller brush, you're getting into some fussiness that can just take you more time and then also make the paint, have the result be a little overworked. So general, great, you know, sort of approach is to use the biggest brush that you can all the time. So I like to have one for washes. That is something like this. Um, I should have brought, I should have found my old brushes because they were, I think I still have them around too. Um, or you could use like a big, it kind of looks like a, like a makeup brush, like a big poofy brush that holds a lot of water and puts a lot of water down. And then I like to have one that's broad and tapers, um, like this style, or that's just broad and flat. Now I'm getting back into watercolors from about a 25 year hiatus. So I'm still, there's new stuff. <laughs> um, and I'm still kind of remembering and figuring out what what I like. And I also have been doing a lot of oil painting and I'm a little bit stuck on those brushes. So like I said, we're going to learn and evolve together. And then one or two round brushes. This is a nice size for the size that we're working. You just, you don't want to get too thin. So even on something like the eye, this comes to a point and I can get a nice amount of detail um, and and even like the little you know if I'm trying to make little accents in the feathers this tip is very fine so I don't need a teeny tiny brush someone asked about the water brush pens that mm -hmm. they were new to them did you yes use those I did and I I left them at home and I'm actually really happy with the quality of those brushes and the performance of those brushes mm -hmm. I get a little it's nice having the water there, but I feel like I can't control it as much as I like to. Uh, so I stopped using them, but I do, that's not true. I have them at my workstation at home and I use them because of the varied brush tips. Mm. So they're awesome. They're, they're great. And they did have, if you're using those, you, when we do this first pass, you're going to want to use the biggest, um, broadest brush. Keep your coffee mug away from the water jars. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I need my coffee today. So <laughs> we might have a... <sighs> Kelly has learned to use a covered cup with a straw. So she doesn't drink her, sippy paint, cup. her paint water. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. I am going to... I'm working on 9 by 12. But I have my edges taped. I already stretched my paper. And I did my layout on eight and a half by 11, which basically is what this ends up being once you tape the edges. So we're gonna work from this grid, which is going to help us draw. Um, I did get a little light box, which I'm gonna play with more and share with you guys um, because that basically helps you trace an image. And, um, and we're gonna talk more about transferring you know, images and tracing and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, just just mm -hmm. so you know, the sketch mm -hmm. that you have on the paper, can't, you can't really see okay. it. So mm -hmm. put it at a slight angle. Okay. Just so people can get And it. I can also zoom, which yeah. will, I'm sure, help. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah, when it's like that, you can totally yeah. see it. Yeah, and I, I did, I can draw, I'll draw a little darker on here real quick, because um, that will help. And um, Talbot printed this image out for me, which is almost to, I guess that is to scale, really. So basically, if I had my light box here, I could put that behind and draw my hummingbird. Now, nothing wrong with that, but part of what I would like for us to do is work on our draftsmanship and our drawing techniques. Um, it's, it's just going to give you another tool in your toolbox when it comes to creating the art that you want to create, right? So no, um, there's good reason. There's good reason, even though we have all these tools, but you could go, you could go either way. So let me just darken this up a little bit. And as I do, 
Well, no. What I will do is I will draw on my watercolor paper and I'll do that darker so that you can see it than what you should do. Whenever I draw my sketch on my watercolor paper, I draw very lightly because I, I need that to come off. But to get started, we're going to make a few guidelines. And the way we're going to do this is find the center of your paper. It doesn't matter if you go from tape to tape or paper edge to paper edge, but find a center. So in that case, it's four and a half. And then we're going to work from the center line in um, certain measurements. So we're going to make another line um, two and a quarter inches out from this one on each side. So Tony's asking, is tracing like cheating? And not right, really drawing. Right, right. She it's, says what she says. <laughs> just wondering if I said I drew it, but not really is that okay. <laughs> so, so, you know, in my like artistic life background, I considered tracing cheating because I wanted to be a good drawer. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so, but no, it's not. You know, we're making art. It doesn't matter what you do. That's sort of what my little speech was about. Still honing our skills mm -hmm. is always good, right? So, um, I mean, I could absolutely see wanting to paint, especially so lately I've been doing portraits and figures. It is so frustrating to get the shapes accurate. It is very difficult and frustrating. I could see being like, I just want to paint, right? I just want, and tracing mm -hmm. my image so, so that, that I can, can just paint. paint. and. Absolutely. And, and I know it's, you know, when people are doing the needle felting 2D, the idea of a transfer is especially mm -hmm. like a pet portrait. Mm -hmm. So no, not, not, not cheating. I mean, you might want to say if someone asks you specifically, did you draw that? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I okay. It. <laughs> and then top to bottom, we want to find a center. Um, I'm going to, um, I'm going to scoot my ruler weird and say that I'm working within these 11 inches and I'm going to make my center at five and a half, five and a half inches and then just go perpendicular. If you're using a block of paper, do you tear off the top sheet or do you paint on the block? If you're using a watercolor block, the whole reason it's there is so that you can first just wet your paper with clear water. It will bubble up. This is called stretching. And because it's secured on, on all four sides, that's what this tape is doing. So then when you paint, you leave it on there and it helps hold it down. That's why okay. it's made the way that it's made. And it has a little, one little spot that there is no adhesive. So when your painting's all done, you take a scissors or an X-Acto blade, put it in that spot and go around and then remove it from the block. Okay, does not matter how perfect these lines are. They're just guides, right? But the next one that we're gonna put is two and three quarters inches from the center line in each direction. So this is just giving us all getting on the same page with, um, with our drawing do and you, it's good practice do you prepare this this way to teach this or is this how you approach sketching something that you're going to draw i prepare it this way to teach it okay. <laughs> like you eyeball it and draw yeah i eyeball it unless like i said if it's really being tricky for me okay um, i might make a grid or um but it's just like, like with the needle felting projects, to teach it, I need to like fully understand it. I need to convey it in a way that everybody right. understands because I can go at something in my own creative flow, you know, but then I wouldn't be able to teach, teach that. Yeah. 
Okay, how is the... I wonder... Do you think if we turn down the lights just a little bit, Talbot, it'll have a better... I mean, I can see the light. Okay, yeah, okay but... you can see it? Okay. Um... All right, I'm going in. I'm going in a little further because you don't need to see around me right now. Okay, the, the flower... This, I'm going to draw right on here. This is an oval. And I'm putting that oval a little bit tilted and mainly in this quadrant right here, but I'm letting it come out over here and a little bit out over here. Do not be a slave to the image. This is a natural object. It, they, you know, the one right next to this looks nothing like this. So the one, meaning the flower that we don't see. <laughs> so don't, this is, this is meant to be um, our interpretation. The inspiration for this project came from the request for flowers. I have to say flowers and watercolor are not my thing, not my favorite thing. I've done them. It's about looseness and transparency. They're delicate and <laughs> Which is probably why, in part, I went with the bee balm because it's a little bit more saturated and there's a lot of depth to it. But in a more delicate flower with the watercolors, you really are trying to have minimal, um, um, minimal layers, you know, and, and make the impact and the contrast in sort of broad strokes kind of thing um, to keep it to give it that delicate and somewhat transparent look that flowers actually have. And then if we were to imagine a stem coming at an angle from this, it's going to it's going to sort of intersect this this intersection right here. And again, it doesn't have to be perfectly straight, right? You can give it a little you know, it, you don't need to do this. Um, then the flower has this dark area which is also either a little rectangle or oval so i'm just going to indicate that with um with this rectangle and i changed the leaves a little bit i don't like that this leaf ends right in line with this leaf this leaf ends right in line with the stem we want it to be a little bit weirder, right? We gotta, we gotta, you don't want everything lining up that's not interesting to the eye. So we, um, and you guys were, I, I was seeing this in what you guys have painted already and I was like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. So I extend this leaf down, I move this leaf over and, you know, so that there are tips coming at different angles and not just, all lined up. So let's go ahead and, and make a few leaves. I'm going to start with this one that comes way out and bring it almost, you know, to the center line. And then there's one tucked in here. And like I said, we're going to, well, I want to get a little bit, I like this darkness here, but I want this to come Bring that one down further. You'll see, you'll be able to see this more clearly as I eliminate um, some of my guidelines here. And then we have one coming off kind of centered. They do overlap each other. And I'm going to let that one turn out so that it is not lining right up with the stem. And we're gonna make one this way. And maybe there's one pointing back here. Right there. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get some of these lines out of here. Yeah, I think, I think it might help, yeah.
Also, I need to, I didn't switch my playback. Oh, it's not the speed. The color might look a bit more yellow, just because that's predominantly what okay. it is. Okay, okay. You know, you can try and fix that. Okay. All right, in the flower, I do like to indicate some of these petals that are in this this dark area right here. There's sort of this dome of, dome of darkness. <laughs> Um, so again, they don't have to be exactly like the, um, exactly like the painting or the reference image, but you do want to get some of these indicated that way. It's just a mental reminder to save that space when we're in the process of making all of this dark. Okay, and then towards the top, be very random. You don't even really have to draw this. You're just kind of making indicators of where the top of the flower is. Okay, hummingbird. Find the approximate center of this line and put a dot there. And then we're gonna draw a line from that to this corner. And that is kind of like the angle of our hummingbird. I don't know if that is completely accurate to this, but this is how I figured it out <laughs> to convey it. So that's what we're doing. And then extend this line a half an inch beyond that dot. And then extend a half an inch horizontally from that dot. And this is kind of like giving us a, a zone for the, for the hummingbird's head. This intersection at the bottom is where his little feet are. So I'm drawing those in there, although I don't really like care. They can be a few black lines at the end um, if you want to. Hard to see again. Hmm. I just have to draw, um, draw uh, darker. <laughs> it's like against my... <laughs> going against my um, my ingrained so this line represents the angle of the bird and like I said, this back point here is where his little feet are in the picture. And so the belly comes off of the feet. Well, let's start with the head because that's gonna give you, give you a better spot. We, drew, we took this line out a half an inch and we took this a horizontal line out half an inch. From there, you can kind of connect the dots and I'm, I'm making it rounded and make his, the top of his head. And let's get the angle of the beak is kind of like, I mean, it can be, it can be anything, but not like that. This belly can drop below this horizontal line. You don't have to, these lines are guidelines. You don't have to 
keep it, you know, in a box. Like let it let your drawing flow. But it's just to help us um, figure out where the hummingbird is. My hummingbird is about four inches long um, from. Where did I go from? Yeah, from head to this colored part of the tail. So we have this extended gray part and we have this colorful part. This is four inches. And then from the wing to the belly is, is four inches. So that also is another helpful thing. So you could actually like put that little mark and know that you're you're in the right uh, the right size. So the wing comes off of the back about halfway across this square and angles up to this line. And I use this vertical line, this one on the right, as kind of like the guideline for the wing. It gets all blurry, so again, I'm not making a shark fin it it you know it has some shape to it but this is a great guideline for the back edge of the wing and i don't know what to do about this white spot i guess in the past i was covering it up but i guess we'll we'll include it um it's got this little light spot on his back here Yeah, I feel like I can see it. I wonder, try try the dimmer. I'm just curious. Is it that one? Yeah. 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 We're getting dark. That's all right. They don't need to see me. They need to see the they need to see the the piece of the white piece of paper. It's always makes like such a glare. Okay, the eye is on this um well, it's kind of in between these two lines that we have coming off of this vertical line here. Maybe kind of more on the the horizontal one. It's it's not it's closer towards the beak than to the back of the head, ever so slightly. It's not centered in the middle of the head. Let me erase some stuff now. One thing I love about little hummingbirds is their little square heads. So you guys probably don't see a square, but I see this as kind of squared off. They don't have those super roundy domed, you know, thick neck heads that songbirds have. A thick neck head? <laughs> yeah. It could be like an where they're like like where you're like where does their head end and their body begin? They're just little puff. Oh yeah, that looks better. That looks good. I probably have him a little bit fat. I, I did. I kept doing that. So this doesn't quite come so. Give him a little tummy tuck there. So then I've got my four inch mark for my tail feathers and I don't want to totally run out of paper. So I'm making his little tail a little bit shorter than it is in the reference image. I'm not going to be able to eliminate these lines, but I'm going to try. While I work on getting these <laughs> dark gouges out of my paper. You guys can refine your drawing. Just 
just looking to see what's going on. Everyone's very quiet. Everyone's very quiet. Um, Hopefully everybody's creating. Another mm -hmm. suggestion to, uh, that this would make a lovely 2D felting. Yes, we have a hummingbird, a 2D hummingbird, kind wet. of in this position. Wet with, with wet felted, with red flowers, but... Someone could essentially try to draw this and then direct felt it. Right. Yeah. Oh, this is going to be fun. I do love watercolors. Their beak has like a little bit of a curve to it, which this bird's beak is dipped into the flower. We don't see the whole length of it. Um, it has like a petal cutting it off, but um, depending on how you paint your flower, it may or may not look like that. And I'm not gonna draw the grass. I'm just gonna put, you know, random fronds in at the end where I, I think they need to be according to the composition. Okay, are you guys ready to paint? <laughs> you know the heart when you like what's going on, you can click the little heart. Yeah. It covers people's comments. Like, oh. Like it, like I'm missing a word. Oh, of weird. The most recent comment. I think you are too, because the heart's there. Oh. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Is it covering? Yes. Like I Do we're supposed to heart it? Or they're, that's our heart? I think it's. The, if we feels... heart it, does it go away? No, I think it's just there. Oh gosh, yeah, that's strange. Bad design, YouTube. So, Deb, I can't read whatever that word is. <laughs> Just shout it. Uh, shout it. Sorry. Mm. I just noticed it last time, and I couldn't answer questions until someone else commented so I could read the question. Oh, my gosh. It's almost two. <laughs> it's only 144. How did that happen? <laughs> this could be a two-parter. <laughs> no, we can do it. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and paint at my pace because otherwise... Um, we might be here for a long time. So, um, the first thing I want to do is wet my paper and, but I am going to be careful to leave a few zones white. I want to leave the flower white because this bright pink is a complementary color to the green that we're going to paint the background. And so if I were to let this become green, it would be very hard to get the vivid pink that we want. Now, down here, I don't mind. The whole bird, actually, I don't mind, especially the wing, because I want some of that transparency, that that blur, that see-through. But I do want this little white, you know, belly to stay white. And we talked about leaving this spot white. And the white of the eye, I need to stay white. But other than that, I'm going to wet the paper and with clean water and it is okay for the green to go everywhere except for those key spots 
So I try to be a little random around my flower and not, you know, paint a green oval, but I am precise around the belly. What kind of uh, tilted board is that on? It's just a piece of masonite. You can get that at the um, art store. You can get that at the art store. Watercolors need to be, and then from the, from the pink of the flower down, I don't, I'm not worried about getting green there. Um, yes, so watercolors, it's tough to work flat. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can work flat, it's just you have to be careful with your drawing of foreshortening. And then, um, you can't go vertical, obviously. Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit of like a let's work quickly. Now I probably should have mixed some paint puddles before I wet all this paper. Um, let's see, on my palette, I am going to, let me scoot over this way. Get this over this way. I'm going to use my dropper, make a nice little one inch puddle. And I'm gonna use a whitish brush. And I'm gonna get that green, that cadmium yellow, and the um, cad yellow. It's number. It's number three on the older set, and um, this cobalt teal or emerald number sixteen on the old, older set, and mix those together. I want this to be rather light. I can always, I can always drop more in and darken it up, you know? So this is like a really like kind of chartreuse, which is awesome. And we'll use that in the bird as well. But I'm going to drop this in here. And... Yeah, my paper's already... When you go with, oh, look, I got it right onto that spot on his back. I said I wasn't going to do that. Um, when you get into uh, better paper, it, this, this would just like bleed like beautifully. Mm. Whereas I'm already having, um, now there are a few options. I could try to wet those edges or I could spray them down, which might help bleed them out. I'm going to get my bigger brush in here because I was getting bogged down. And like I said, I'm doing a vignette, meaning I'm not going all the way to um, my paper edges. So the spray bottle is going to help me. <laughs> Uh, keep some randomness here. On my screen, it's coming across more yellow. It's definitely more green. Yeah, it's more green. That's so interesting what the camera wants to pick mm -hmm. up and not pick up. And it's very light right now, so I'm going to definitely drop, um, drop some deeper color in here. So I'm going to deepen this up a little bit. by saturating my puddle with more pigment. Um, I did that first one on the light side, but now I can go in and... And I am not really looking at my reference picture at this point. I'm just doing it. Um, definitely want to get a bit darker around the belly so that that pops. And then find a few places to drop, drop some more color in. I really like, was it Kelly, um, Kelly Gawkey who did that wet on wet kind of start to a, to a landscape. It was really pretty. I don't remember. There's been, yeah, it's been a lot of good stuff. Very cool stuff in there. Now this kind of just naturally went around my bird. That's fine. Like my hummingbird isn't green. Mm. That's fine. I'll, it, um, I don't really want it green. About what 
what size board is that? Um, this looks to be about 18 by 24. Okay. Since I know I, I want these leaves on the darker side, I'm just go ahead and paint some of that in there. And get some of these random shapes around this flower. Now, I liked um, swishing in my dirty water, wiping off my brush, and then going in my clean water. I liked dropping some orange in here. I liked the way that it balanced out this bright green a little bit. Um, so I'm going to use... You guys have um, cadmium orange or just orange. And I'm gonna make this rather saturated because this is pretty wet right now. So if I make my orange too watery, it's just gonna be like bleh, and not have any, not oh. <laughs> have any, yeah. So I wanna drop it in like with some, with some saturation. And this color is going to be in the hummingbird, so it's fun to go ahead and get it, um, get it going on here. Put some of it in the wing, and then just think about it being in a few places. Ooh, I really like that those colors together. And then I'm gonna do the same thing with some purple. I accidentally got like a ton of purple paint on my palette. I don't know if you guys can see that, it's like way in the corner. Um, oh, that's pretty dark. It's too dark, don't go that dark. So I need more water and then I'm gonna actually go ahead and mix my purple with a little bit of my green just so that it's not, just so that I'm toning it down a tiny bit. That was pretty saturated. This will be a little more grayed. And I'm just pretending like I understand what these weird shadows are in the background. Different, uh, vegetative happenings back here. Um, this is the, I mixed purple into my green, so it's I've got a little bit of a gray color. So since I want these wings blurry, I'm just gonna go ahead and put that in while it's wet to just um, take advantage of that blurriness. You know, this painting process is a little less rigid and step-by-step step than the felting that you may do or we've done together. So um, everybody's gonna have kind of different things happening right now, which is exciting. All right, while this is wet, we need to give this some time to dry before we get into our hummingbird because we want paint to stay in specific places. I'm going to paint my flower this bright pink and all I'm gonna do is make a clean puddle and use magenta um, in the original set that's gonna be your number eight, your pink, um, your vibrant pink. And um, so just make a nice clean puddle of that and paint your flower. And since this might still be a little bit wet, that's kind of a good thing because we want those exterior flower petals to maybe ever so slightly blend into the green. Watercolor is a lot about timing. Um, I'm confused because my palette is 90 degrees to my... Oh, another thing you can do, and I keep 
like forgetting to emphasize this. Have a piece of mm. crap paper that you test. test your colors on. I'm just throwing them on here, but really we can have, I think underneath you, are there a couple of pads? Cause this is my good one. Mm -hmm. I have, I have paper that's not great. So for example, thank you. I'm, I'm making my magenta and I wanna know how is it? Is it is it saturated enough? Is it um, is it too light? Is it too dark? I want to go a little bit a little bit more saturated than that. Okay, I can paint this whole thing. I'm not um, I'm not worried. I know everything is going to be darker than this color, so I can go ahead and put. this everywhere. And as I get towards the bottom here, I'm just gonna saturate it a little bit more. Oh, it's such a pretty color, oh my gosh. That's great. And I think I'm gonna saturate it a little bit, one little spot of it, and put some of it into the center of these of these leaves. I love this about bee balm, the way the the way the leaves go from purple to green. That will get uh, blended down the road, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and fan that out with some clean water. So I'm cleaning my brush. And then with clean water, I can just take those edges and fan them out a little bit. There's a lot of technique to watercolor, um, just sort of little things that you can do to manipulate paint, which I know you guys are going to just get more and more familiar with. And I don't really need this hard line down here, so I'm going to get rid of that. This is kind of an accident, but I don't care. I'm gonna leave it. I'm not gonna try to fix it. It looks like a like a random petal that's coming off. Ooh, I like um, I like the way this wing is looking. Okay, the hummingbird is really fun. I've had a lot of fun dropping these saturated colors in, and I want you guys to. Take this as an opportunity to, to just do that. Like you can look at the image and you are inspired by the image, but do not try to paint individual feathers. Um, the one thing I am keeping, like making a point to try and do, is a few spots of orange within all of the blue on the head. I really like that. And especially on my screen, I can see the iridescence of the blue feathers in the head. And so I try to keep some lighter colors kind of on the center line of the head and then darker towards the edges. But other than that, it's a little bit of a free-for-all. So you are welcome to just paint your heart out or, um, oops, I realized I have a kind of a weird spot over here. Or um, watch, like almost treat it like a demo and then and then do yours. Okay, I'm gonna switch to a brush that I feel like I have a little more control over, but still being big. So I like this one, it's flat, but it comes to a tip. And I'm gonna start by I'm trying to think. I'm, I'm pretty much using paint directly from each pan, so I'm, I'm not worried about starting with some paint puddles. I do want to make this wet, uh, leaving the white 
leaving the white area. This brush is so crazy. It almost has like too much. Let me try, let me try this one. So this is a little smaller. That one is comes to such a tip that I kind of lose track of where the tip is and I don't want to uh, mess up like around my eyeball and stuff like that. So now I'm being careful. This isn't dry dry, but it's dry enough that I don't think my paint will bleed into it. If you're concerned about that weight and or work with a blow dryer next to you and just hit the paper for a minute, um, you do not want these saturated bird colors going outside of the bird. So make sure that, you know, you think you're, you're ready. Pretty much, um, if you paint a new wet area, it will stay, it will stay within it. But if, if your background is still really wet, just, just wait. So even though I'm working very saturated, I still like to go light to dark. Actually, it's not really. It's still white down there. So I'm gonna start with some yellow and orange. Yellow being um, the lightest aspect of these um, chartreuse colors that are in here. We want overhead a bit brighter now to see the color better or not? It's coming across. Okay, you can try it. I'm not sure what you can, that's going to help or not. Side ones. Okay. I still have some of my orange color, but I'm going to saturate that by adding more yellow and more orange to it. And I have a very vibrant orange. Yeah, we're gonna have to like do some like art lighting research. It's coming across just a lot more pastel than it really is. Yeah. I think that's good. Okay. Now, I don't see orange on this edge, but I know that when I put green in here and it touches the orange, it's gonna turn into this um, gray-brown color. So now I'm gonna use the same colors that I used on the background, that um, cadmium yellow, really bright yellow, and that bold um, cobalt teal or emerald A request to see more of your palette as mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. where the roller is. Oh, uh, I can't have it on a tilt. Oh. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. From overhead, it looks like you could. <laughs> uh, I know. But I can scoot like this. How's that? Is that better? I think that's good. Okay, I gotta keep working, gotta keep working, people. The water's drying. I know. Now, if I put this green into this orange, it's going to um, brown. So that's a choice. Up here, I don't want it to turn brown. I want it to be blue against orange. The picture, um, <laughs> the picture on the laptop is so much, so much better than the printout, you know? So I'm putting some pure yellow and then I'm going to put, um, some really bright blue so that I'm getting spots of pure blue instead of mixing the green like it kind of like they kind of bounce off each other and I want a little bit of ultramarine
I'm mixing ultramarine and the cobalt teal. Cobalt is opaque and ultramarine is transparent. I really need my other image. Wow, this looks such a difference. Okay. Putting more pure color in here. Pure cobalt teal or pure emerald. Number 16 on the other palette. This is trickier. This is definitely trickier than, than the fox. Right now, I'm totally going to leave my eye. And I am not expecting to get this hummingbird completely correct by just dropping color in. Um, there's going to be another layer. This is just us trying to be loose about it and get some, get some good things happening. And I can go ahead and paint my beak in a blue tone. It's going to have some darker um, black shadows, but the um, turquoise blue is a nice initial color for it. Um, don't expect yours to look just like mine. They're, these birds are like so varied. It's really, it's really cool. I'm gonna take, um, begin to get some darkness into the wing and I'm going to mix um, purple and viridian. In the core colors, it's the thallo green and in the other set, it is viridian. So purple and viridian or alizarin and viridian will basically make a version of black. I have a good amount of purple on my palette. I gotta, I don't know, I gotta keep scooting here. I accidentally dropped way too much paint in there. so pretty it's so much better to use layers of transparent dark color than to paint black <laughs> like to use black black is opaque it's um it has no light it doesn't have a lot of life and this is nice it blends right into our um greens that we have going on here that looks really cool Awesome. And I'm just going to put a thin glaze of this back here. So even this, like, it's not as dark as it can be, but, um, I started at one angle and now I'm changing it, but it'll be okay. Um, 
I can always go darker. Just go build slowly. Sorry, I, I am bouncing around a little bit as I, as I see things. So uh, it's not gonna be a perfect step-by-step -step situation, but I know you guys can do it. I've already seen it. I want to blend these out a little bit. So I'm gonna do a nice clean brush. and just go in there with a clean brush and give myself a little bit of blur. And then I can re-darken and redefine um, some shapes. It's like doing makeup. Blend, blend. <laughs> Sculpt. Oh my gosh, I get so many like makeup ad reels. Really I'm, I'm just constantly seeing women smear various things on their face <laughs> and they're getting more and more ridiculous like because they're trying to catch your eyes so i saw one where this woman's got foundation and she's, she's just like oh, rubbing gobs of foundation on her okay i'm assessing deciding what i want to put while it's wet and i think i'm going to take some very pure ultramarine and blue and get some of these deeper blues around the edge of my hummingbird. So I'm taking some clean water and just the ultramarine. I can test my saturation. Um, this is gonna be for impact, so I'm gonna go a little darker. Yeah, it's pretty neat, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like, it's a water situation. Like, <laughs> it's all about the water. Managing your water. That's why I think those brushes uh, were tough for mm -hmm. me. The, the ones that you squeeze. Because I'm like, oh, geez. Like, all of a sudden, oh, boy, this isn't going to be good. Because it needs my right fingerprint. Okay. Blue, 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 blue. Okay. Blue. Got a nice real like dark spot right here. I'm trying to preserve some orange. But this blue pretty much comes under his throat. Lots of blue on the back of the head. Very dark in here. And then I'm gonna return to my teal or emerald and pull some of these things together with it. And then once that's dry, I'll go in with a dark and kind of make a few suggestions. And that's what makes the iridescence is this bouncing of light and dark. So I'm back to the, to the teal. or the aqua color. And I just wanna, I don't want it to be like spotty. Like I, I want things to flow. And right now I've got it a little bit, stay awake, stay awake. I've got it a little bit spotty. Okay. 
And then let's let's use some of our wing gray at the bottom edge here. So that was the purple and um, viridian. And I just want to gray, give give some quiet space. With the orange, it'll be a little bit brown, which is nice. Just a little bit, and then I'll um, blend that out with some clean water. Just want to have some spots that are quiet in terms of color, a little less riotous. Trying to make my edge varied and not perfect. You don't want them to be look like a penguin. <laughs> you got something against penguins, <laughs> right? <sighs> Ooh, I can't wait to see everybody's paintings. Although I feel like I've I've gotten such a great uh, preview. Yeah. The belly needs a little shadow. And a great shadow color, like I said, we want to keep we want to keep using the same colors. A great shadow color is going to be orange mixed with the um I'm not sure what you guys can see anymore. Mixed with the um cobalt teal or the emerald. So try it. Try a little, just a little spot. You don't need a ton of water, just a little dip of your paint brush into the clean water. Add some orange and then pick up a little bit of your um, cobalt teal. And it's going to be a little green. Let's look at it. A little kind of like muted green, which is perfect because that is reflecting all of the um, um, what's going on around it, right? Like, so I'm just going up under the belly a little bit and into the butt and then I'm going to clean my brush and give that a little softer edge we can drop a tiny bit of purple in there too just be careful that it's not like super super saturated purple like that it needs to be it needs to be on the on the faint side and that is also exactly the same colors we used in our background. You're fine, Jenny. <laughs> Jenny Slitcher trying to creep jumping up in the camera. <laughs> so just putting a little bit, I don't know what you guys can see, I closed my video. Just putting a little bit onto the belly of shadow, now it it looks a little more three-dimensional and less like we're um, painting, painting a flat object. I'm going to go back into the wing and with the um, purple viridian combo, I'll show you my, there's my tester. And this time I'm keeping it a little bit more um, localized kind of following the shape that I see in the image oh I'll tell you what we put a brown an orange glaze on this and it is going to be the exact color that we see in that, in that picture that was loud <laughs> That scared everyone. <sighs> Sorry, dogs. Kyla is always in a mode of um, dog dog management. <laughs> management. <laughs> I need someone to throw me snacks. I I mean I could. <laughs> I'm on it. I might accidentally toss you the dog food. I don't know why she's sound asleep and then she needs to jump up and say hi. It's looking cool. Sometimes when I have a color on my brush, you kind of look around. If it's especially if it's like a color you're excited about, you kind of look around and start bouncing it around, you where know, where where it needs to go, yeah. 
I'm gonna I'm gonna paint the eyeball. All it is is the same dark color, but leave leave that white highlight so it's not super um, accurate right now. I'm just making this oval shape, but leaving that that white highlight. And you can do the same thing with the feet. You know, I mean, you don't even really just an in, just a little indication. It's not. Don't get into like painting perfect little um, bird feet. I really want to have um, some guest artists show us, you know, their techniques. My friend Tacy has done mm. just she's been she's been doing watercolors straight on for I don't know twenty years, and um, she's become very good. And I haven't talked to her yet, but maybe she'll come. Come and teach us a thing or two. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, that is drying to a degree that we can uh, go back in. I just see something I want to do here. Get a little bit more of this. Just a little less orange right there. Um, let's do another layer on our flower. It's gonna start to pop. How are we on time? It's two twenty-two. Okay, good. We're in good shape. We're gonna, we're gonna do this. Do this watercolor. <laughs> I'm gonna come in with like <laughs> paint and a whistle. Mm. <sighs> I'm gonna be the anti-Bob Ross. <laughs> It'll be nothing happy about this. I almost cussed. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing happy about this. <laughs> well, there was a line in the in the show. In I'm just giving you all a chance to catch up. In um, fool me once with a soccer coach. He's like, "This is soccer. If you want me to be nice, go take an art class." <laughs> this is art. <laughs> All right, let's make our, let's go back into our magenta. What? What's he doing? He could be known as Rob Boss. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yes, boss. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be the, oh gosh, I was going to say something about Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> so rip, ripping stuff <laughs> It's terrible. There's a reason that art is not like that. This is very, you know. Yeah. Well, I could go on and on. Okay. I, I have my saturated magenta. And what I'm going to do is just put another layer in here without too much like, oh, it can't go there. It's got to go here. But I'm kind of thinking like the sun's coming this way. So I'm leaving some edges not as saturated. I'm not trying to go over and resaturate the entire thing, but this is going to start to give us a little bit of dimension to these um, random petals here. You know, you could leave you could leave a few spots kind of un untouched. Very curious about the alcohol inks because it was really fun to see how those... I, I am going to go ahead and saturate everything down in this <laughs> orb of... What did I call it? Dome of darkness. <laughs> because I want all of this to be darker. But once we get up towards the top of the flower here, I'm just doing little random random strokes. You could even extend petals out a little farther, put some of these weird bits and bobbles that are on the on the edges here. I like this brush is good. This brush is good for this project. It's um holds a nice amount of paint. And, but then also has a good tip to it. 
There's some weird little random sticky offy things. Definitely dark over here. And then the next pass, we'll add some alizarin crimson and purple. And then we don't want to overwork it, but a, probably a final pass will be some very dark um, alizarin and viridian. And I can go ahead and I can go ahead and put this down in this dark zone, but I I do it does kind of turn to green here, so probably not the that was probably confusing to you. Let's put a little bit of darker green right in here so that you know where we are on the flower. I'm just going back into my I have kind of like a green puddle. Um. I put a little bit of viridian in there to, so it's not that quite as um you know bright green but I'm just going to paint this and paint this dark so you can see where we are here. I'm keeping those remember we drew out a few petals I'm keeping those light. But this whole zone between the flower and the leaves is is dark. Do you use alcohol inks on watercolor? What kind of paper? I don't know. We're gonna have to find out more. Maybe we could have alcohol ink guest artist. While I have this on my brush, I'm going to get this dark edge and shadowy spot under here. This is a nice composition. Mm -hmm. Remember I said we were going to put orange on here? I'm going to try it. Don't, don't do it until I test it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use this, um, what is this color? Something orange. Pie roll. I just feel like it's going to brown it out, yes. Yes, I like that. Okay, so this is orange over the viridian and purple and it's just gonna brown it out. I like that a lot. I think the bird is dry enough to go in with a few kind of dark um, ultramarine lines and make, I'm, just, I'm actually gonna like make a few little feather lines. Um, I think that'll, I think that'll look really cool. I'm hoping, I'm gonna use this um, pointy brush. It's not very tiny brush, but it does make a nice point. And I'm just gonna take pure um, ultramarine if you roll your brush tip, it kind of, it puts the paint right on the tip and gives you a lot of control. It's called Yupo paper. It's non, a non-porous paper okay. for alcohol ink. Yeah, I think alcohol ink, it's like kind of, kind of works because it's like slippery, right? Jennifer was doing it. Yeah. yeah. Jennifer. It definitely, like the pigment flows to the edges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This um, step kind of from a distance aids in the iridescent look, especially if you can get it right next to a nice bright color. Don't cover up all your lights. Um, just accentuate them. So, 
Ani Kamareri. <laughs> Don't leave me to my own devices. I'll quote movies. if you can zoom in perhaps. yes yes good idea definitely that's why you're here that you whoa is, can i whoa, we're going it. the wrong way <laughs> i got it i got it at the request of susan we are zooming we're zooming mm, i zoomed <clears throat> to where you can't see the reference <laughs> I can be able to see the palette. <laughs> uh, I'm just putting it there for a minute so they can see where we are with it. You know, sap green is really pretty. I kind of want to put some of it in there. I didn't. I didn't put it in my um, original one. And honestly, the inexpensive palette sap green is prettier than hmm. the expensive palette sap green. Interesting. Yeah, and that actually would be cool in the background as well. Oh well, when you do your second one, you can play with all kinds of colors. Where is that? I'm, I'm doing it. Getting some sap green. Now, I'm introducing a color late in the game, but it's going to be okay. I'm going to put it over here on my other palette so you guys can hope. Oh my, I zoomed so much. My uh -huh. other palette isn't in the shot anymore. This would have been a good color for the background. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to zoom out just a little bit um, so that we can see everything. But, um, all right, I've got some sap green. Where do I want to put it? Nice and rich. Oh, you just moved. I moved? No, uh, Talbot I moved you, you across the other. Oh, I was like, <laughs> You're on the he way. did. Sap green is warm and um, muted and saturated. All right, time for, gosh, we could do, let's do that little eye. Let's get a nice, get into your dark purple viridian, super saturated, and do another pass at that eye, being very careful. I should have zoomed back in again, but just being very careful not to hit the white spot. And I really need glasses at this point. <laughs> so this is by feel. And then let's do a little bit on the beak. We've got this little dark nostril spot right there. We've got a little darkness coming off of the eye. A little dark spot behind. I said beak, but then I saw other dark places. The less water, the darker. I mean, I know I'm stating the obvious here, but. Okay. You're saying some fancy color names. Rena said, I've never taken color theory or a painting class. When you say the name of colors, it's always interesting to see what the color <laughs> actually is. And Polly agrees. Yes. And I promised that we would talk about color more and I need to not make a project and just do color. Honestly, I have never had a color theory class, so I'm not, I know what I, 
no, but I'm not like formally. I don't formally know. I'm not I'm not certified. <laughs> there's just there's so much to it. There's so much to it. Um but I you know. No, I know a little. I know a little. Enough to for us to do what we need to do. So just to show you, if you had a spot that you're like, yee, that's not great. If you take a clean brush, clean water, and I'm just trying to think of a spot to, to remove. Here we go, down here. And I'm like, this got too dark or it's too one color. Just kind of scrub on that spot with your clean brush. Keep cleaning the brush and wiping it off. And you can lift. Mm -hmm. I mean, that took... Oh, wow. Yeah. Let me zoom in on that. Mm, okay. I just lifted this white spot out. So you are not without <laughs> possibilities in terms of um, some, erasing. Yeah. At some point, you work the paper a lot. At like some point, have, you overwork the paper, yeah. I didn't have great paper, and my fox eyeballs, <laughs> it sort of... Yes, and the better the paper, the more it holds up to all of that. Okay. Now, I need to fill this back in, and to relate these um, two areas, I'm going to put a glaze of sap green in here. It's actually the perfect color, so... So I'm just trying to get my white spot, the spot that I just erased, <laughs> um, filled back in. Okay, we're getting there. All we're, we're gonna do another pass at this with the magenta um, or the bright purple mixed with um, alizarin and some actual, it's just purple on both of our palettes. It's just purple. So I'm gonna use my dropper to get a nice little, nice little, Three quarter inch puddle, I'd say, and let me switch. Excuse me, back to the wider brush. And we're gonna get this pretty, pretty good and dark. Alizarin. Um, what did I do? This one. Alizarin is a great color. It's a deep red, it's very vibrant, and it's transparent. And just a little bit of purple. Okay, here we go. Put this here and there. You can refer to your picture, but... Kind of like, we're, we're kind of counting on the randomness to do the work here. Oh, Oliver's in Milo's bed <laughs> versus, you know, any great plot and plan to paint every single one of these petals. I'm in danger of extending my flower farther and farther. Now, this time around, I'm going to start to darken certain spots and leave, leave, um, leave some petals. Rena said, speak with authority and we will believe you. I do. On the color. <laughs> uh, she asked, how do you know which colors are transparent? Um, um, they, well, you learn it, but okay. you, you can also tell because they will be able to glaze without muddiness or opacity or chalkiness. Okay. But you, you also learn it. You know what I mean? Like you just, you know it from, um, being told and. So I'm starting to get some of these dark areas defined, leaving those little petal bumps <laughs> um, that we drew and 
leaving them um, at the shade of, of magenta where we are now. And then once, while that's wet, I can go in with yet a darker color that the really the purple um the purple and viridian mix i'm back in it i'm leaning it more towards purple because i don't want a lot of green in here but it will darken these um these areas that are now wet with this most recent pass But no, I mean, generally that is how I approach my tutorials is <laughs> just, um, not that I'm lying to anyone, but I do try to convey it with as much confidence as I can because I want, I want everyone to feel like they're going to yeah. succeed. You've done it successfully. You know what you're doing. Yeah. Now, as I get down into this green area, I'm going to make little like circles and dots. I don't know what's going on in this part of the flower. It's like, but you want it to be very textured. So I'm con putting this contrasting dark into this green and leaving it, um, leaving it like that it has a lot of texture this is the um this is i didn't do this like totally thinking about it but um this is the tattoo that i have <laughs> so i've become very familiar with it and now it has been uh reworked um so i know how saturated <laughs> All these spots are I'm gonna get um, some really rich magenta and alizarin and um, blend these darks I just see some spots where I'm like oh I need that to be more saturated like around this whole thing don't want to totally take away the light spots but I do see a little more going on there all right, I'm happy with that. I could go, I could keep finessing this, um, but I'm happy with that. Let's get some green and work on our leaves a little bit. Okay, so, I'm gonna zoom out a bit. Okay, okay. Thank you, I forget where I am. Okay, good. Um, I got the sap green. I like the sap green. I'm going to mix the sap green with my Viridian sort of puddle that I have over here. It still has a little bit of the background color in it with the yellow, but um, just making a nice um, medium green. I don't know how to describe it here. I'll show you on my, on my little... And we're going into these um, these leaves. These leaves are the, like kind of the least developed part of the picture, so I have been painting them with the least um, developed detail in my painting, as you've probably noticed. <laughs> like, hmm, why is Sarah avoiding those leaves? Going around the edges and then with a clean brush, blending the green into the pink centers that we made earlier. This side of the flower is a little bit in shadow. Um, 
So I'm going to take a little bit of my purple green mix and drop it in on this side. And also hitting the um, this dark shadow under this leaf here, which I really like this detail. It's important in your painting process to know what you're doing next. Like, um, you don't want to get into just strokes, 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 colors, colors without a clear reason. It's going to happen, especially if you're just getting started. But the more you practice, the, the, the less that happens. You start to have a better understanding and you're setting like, more clarified intentions about why you're putting what you're putting down next. And that just sort of like develops a, um, a more, um, fluent picture. Like, um, whenever I find that I'm stuck on a painting and I, I have to step away, I can't, you can't just force it. You can't just be like, well, I'm going to do this. Cause it's, it's not good. It's got to have a, a reason behind it. So let's put a few of these um, blades of grass. We have this strong thing. We have this strong thing. And then these blades of grass are going to um, pull it all together in a sense. I'm going to use the green that I just mixed that had the sap green, except I'm going to, you guys can see here. I'm going to put a little bit of orange in it because I, I want it to be, um, here, I'll show you on the side. I want it to be slightly less pure than what's here. Things that are, we want to fade away, we want to mute, soften edges, and lower the contrast. Things that we want to come forward, we want sharper edges, more, contrast in value and more contrast in complementary colors, more saturated colors. So this is my more muted green, just has a little bit of orange in it. And I'm going to add some fronds at an angle, thick and thin, kind of let them do their thing. Threes are good. Um, some variation in angle is good. It's pretty easy to get, especially like when we were doing the cloud workshop. Um, the teacher would say, why, like all my cloud poofs would be exactly the same. Mm. And he's like, that has to be more random. You don't realize you're doing it. It's, it's hard. I think it's really hard to be random. Don't overdo this. Um, like I am making sort of three little sections. One, two, three. That's it. I'm not gonna, you know, elaborate and elaborate. And then let's put a little bit of these purple little buds on here. So I'm gonna use the magenta, but to, to tone it down, uh, let's do the same thing. Let's grab some orange. So now it's a little bit of a of a warmer color. That feels like a, a big move. I feel like when people are doing this and they're happy with their hummingbird <laughs> and they're happy with their flower yeah, and they yeah. know they need to make those things, yeah. they're going to be like... Ugh. I'm going to just dab that out a little bit. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was like... Wasn't that Bob Ross's whole thing was he would like... It's like sky, sort of smooth, serene lake, mountains. And then he's like, takes a big old brush and puts a gigantic tree like right down the front of it. 
And when I watched the, um, this is a purple. I'm just putting to give another dimension here. Um, when I watched the documentary, the producer of the show, he's like, every single time, he's like, it, it practically gave him a heart attack that <laughs> he, did all that that he was doing all that work and then just like chunk in this, um, <laughs> this gigantic tree. All right. As always, this is my least strong <laughs> aspect to this painting. And I think it's in part because the reference is the least and... It's just not my favorite part, so I know you guys are gonna do a little bit better. I'm gonna, I think it needs a little bit of of orange and brown, honestly. It's it's a little too pure, I think, is the problem. This color is awesome. Um, this <laughs> too much going on. this is one of the um, Oh, what were they called? Jenny uses them. It's this pigment that you like sprinkle. It's in a powder form, but it's a watercolor. Oh. Um, yeah, I thought that was really cool. But yeah, we needed it to be a little more like that. A little more, a little more um, gritty or like army green maybe. It's too, um, too Viridian. So using the Viridian and my green puddle we need a little bit of blue in there. Let's use the ultramarine since that's what's in the rest of our painting and a little bit of orange. And that is going to give us that like slightly murky, less pure. In the reference, it's the hummingbird pops, the petals pop, but that part is muted yeah it doesn't yeah so this is like um like this is like bleh. it's great on the hummingbird mm -hmm. but this is like flower nature you mm -hmm. know so now we've got it where we need it to be Oh, this is better. And now it's balancing mm. out because we put orange on that black. And I could go, if you wanted this more true, um, more, um, well, darker or cooler, you could go back with, like we could put the ultramarine on that and you mm. could just keep glazing and flopping um, back and forth. Oh, this is this makes me happy. This is better, better, better. Oh, that's good. All right, I'm super, super excited to see what you guys make. I'm very happy with what um, I made today. I hope you're happy with what you made today. Um, next time. I don't know. Maybe I'll be drill sergeant, Sarah. <laughs> Maybe you know. I was just just gonna talk while well, you paint. Um, did you skip, did you guys see the reel where one person puts a piece of paper on the other person's back, and they draw, and then the the person who the paper's on they draw. Oh, so like, like we could put it on the water. Yeah, dry erase board. But I thought it would be cool to do it three, like almost like a. What's that called when you whisper that the telephone, telephone game? Yeah. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> we're going to do it. We we're gonna, do we're it. gonna do it here at Serafina. <laughs> I, um, I think I'm toast, but if I were to keep going with this, um, I think I would, I would just probably do a little more like blending and dropping maybe in the bird I might darken that some especially some spots of that wing even more and then I probably would make parts of this flower practically black 
like okay. like really dark. Um, so that's awesome. Yeah, that was fun. How's everybody? How's everybody doing? Any questions? No, people are enjoying watching the process. It's definitely, it's like mesmerizing and soothing. <laughs> good, good, just good. Just watch it good. transform. Well, I hope everybody gets to a point where they feel that way when they're creating yeah. versus like, ee! Um, because if you can, it really is, it's, you know, it really is a wonderful place to be and spend your time. I find it very um, rejuvenating and, you know, fulfilling and, and I don't know, it's just a um, worthwhile pursuit, I think. Um, yes, please share in the paint puddle and let's talk about what we want to do next and ask questions about supplies, um, you know, different mediums. I, I very, I'm pretty confident to share watercolors, oils, pastels. I've painted with acrylics and done some nice things. It's not my favorite thing to work with, but, um, but I know when you're doing like what my sister Amy's doing, um, that fast drying is like, and, and like journaling and multimedia, it's great for layering. Mm. And there's all kinds of mediums out now that help acrylics that I didn't have, you know, long ago. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I am excited to do it all. I guess my only hesitation with jumping from thing to thing is, um, the cost and everybody, you know, being prepared and having what they need. So I think we'll stick with watercolors for a while. Um, but I do think it would be fun. And I will put some effort into putting together some color mixing. And when I do that, I might use a few different mediums or at least have samples ready to show how it works, um, you know, with different mediums. So that if we go to the effort to make, you know, a color theory video, mm -hmm. it will have, and then we start painting with oils. <laughs> you still could revisit it and, um, and get something out of it. And in the meantime, you know, having some scrap paper or test paper to, um, to, to play with, you know, practice mixing light colors together. I think, um, and I'm going to forget who right now, someone in the group practiced making as many <laughs> colors as she could from the primary colors. That's a, that's a great exercise. See what happens when you mix complementary colors together. They're going to make some form of brown or gray, some sort of neutral. Um, see if you can recreate a color like burnt sienna with only primary colors or, um, you know, you know what I mean? Like there's a lot, there's a lot to play with. And I'm sure there are tons of tutorials out there on color, um, which are now popping up all over my social media because, you know, since we started doing this, so I know they're, I know they're out there. I totally failed on my white spot on this hummingbird. So real quick, I'm just going to put, um, going to put a little bit of someone says I would love to green. see the new painting next to the others oh okay the yeah we can while you're painting yeah let's go muted. overhead Talbot real quick it's all right. okay thanks um also how long does a gum eraser last do they ever get yucky they last a long time they if they're sitting out forever they can get kind of like hard but really I've taken them and re-needed them um, but ultimately, if you were to use the same one all the time, it would get so full of lead <laughs> that it might, mm -hmm. <coughs> that would shorten its, oh, okay. um, its lifespan. Let me just wipe this down. It's enough to Someone not spill saying paint everywhere. Lynn Robinson lives local and does alcohol links. Oh, very I cool. Know. I don't know. Yeah. 
Okay, I'm gonna back out a tiny bit more. Okay, so we can see what we've got here. All right, we have a reference picture. We have, oh my gosh, what's that one? Okay, well yeah, pass me the first one. This was painting number one. I did not like the position of the hummingbird and I very quickly decided I did not want to cover the whole um, mm. image with green. Okay, then this was number two. Thank you. This was with um, the the less expensive palette. I love. I don't know mm. what I did. It's a little more a little more poppy. I like. Mm. I like that. Let's show it next to. Yeah, I, l I like this one a lot. It has a nice. Uh, has a higher contrast. Yeah, I, I, I will. Like I said, I will go back and get spots of this darker. I just I like how messy this is. I It's really fun. And I left parts of the leaves lighter. That was, that was a good day. And then this one, I used those pigments that you drop in, these powdered pigments, and that's why this is so heavy. And this, because that's where I put them. And it just, like this is kind of interesting, but overall, as a painting, this is my least, well, I mean, that one's not even finished. This is my least favorite one. And then this is the one that I did with, um, the new core set when I got them and this is the one that I did today so these are the two most recent um, but yeah I think I have you know three successful successful paintings for different reasons I like I think I like these backgrounds a little bit better than this one. I was fighting with the paper on this one. So any questions about those? Nope, just <laughs> So fun, I'm really, uh, really enjoying, enjoying this. Thank you for joining me, it gives me a good reason to to do this and um, indulge in my desire to paint. So um, I'm very, I'm already excited for what we're gonna do next, even though I don't know what it is. Feel free to put some ideas in the group or I think you guys are able to even start a poll. Um, but yeah, yeah. You know, start any conversation you'd like about it. And um, we'll go from there. Any questions before we go? No. All right. Have a good weekend, everybody. Thank you so much.